presenting your host for the Racecoin podcast, Jay. What's going on, my Racecoin fans? I'm here with Anthony Peacock, a creative director at Mediatica, a renowned PR agency that has worked with F1 drivers, rally drivers, GT drivers, and so much more. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. So, nice to be. Talk, talk us through your background. Like, uh, how did you get started into this world of PR? Well, it was really by accident. I started off as a journalist, um, uh, writing primarily about motorsport, but also about other things as well. And um, as a journalist, I found myself being asked more and more by, by drivers, by other people involved in motorsport, saying, well, you know, what can we do to, to get ourselves a little bit more media coverage, to get ourselves a little bit more exposure? And I started suggesting a few things, which obviously they like the sound of. And then I thought, you know, after a little while, well, why not make a sort of career out of this? And we gradually moved, I gradually moved from journalism to PR, although I still keep up a fair amount of journalism too. I think really to understand PR, you have to be a journalist yourself because you can't answer to what journalists want without knowing what those things exactly are. I think that's a, that's a great way of putting it because obviously it's two sides to a coin. You know, one of the things that I discussed um, in a previous interview was how um, with Alexandra was how she she works in PR too and how, you know, in PR you try and make everything sound as fluffy and as amazing as possible. And in journalism, you know, you still need them to try and convey the message, but you want to, in journalism, try and uncover the truth. Whereas here you're trying to fluff up the truth. <laughs> so, um, I mean, is it a statement you agree with? Absolutely. I mean, I think the thing is, is that um, uh, having been a journalist, you know that journalists are not idiots. Ultimately, there's no point in trying to sort of cover up the truth too much because they will find out. So you tend to get better results, I find anyway, by being honest. I think the job really of PR is not necessarily to persuade people to a certain point of view, but to show them the evidence and to show them a few things that then allows them to make up their own minds. And, um, you know, I think sort of like many PR people are very sensitive to criticism, but you've also got to accept that. If you, if you show people and the, and, and the thing is bad, they've got every right to say it is. If you show people and hopefully it's good, they'll, they'll say it's good. So I think they're probably sort of like, I agree with that 100%, but, you know, I think the, the key thing that PR is missing and that people need to bring to PR is, is honesty above all else. So it's not really a question of covering it. Is honesty, I think, above everything else. Okay. Yeah. It's not really a question of covering the truth. It's, it's more a question of trying to show journalists the truth because they'll find out what it is anyway. So How often do they find out the truth? Give me a percentage, like 90% of the time, 100% of the time? Um, I would say 95% of the time. Um, you know, it's a very, very bad idea, generally speaking, to try and cover something up because you just look like an idiot when it's inevitably found out. <laughs> so what, uh, I mean, have you had experiences where you've tried to cover something up and realized this as a lesson or was it more of a kind of, you already worked in journalism, you already knew that you're the person uncovering the truth and it's so easy to uncover the truth that I'm not even going to bother as a PR agent? Me personally, I've never bothered to hide anything though, even if it is negative. Okay. And um, so how do you really, what is, what is the magic that you work in terms of spinning or kind of rewriting or rewording the truth in a way that people can really relate to it in a, in a way that's a bit more positive, obviously? You know, you don't want to obviously make it sound worse yeah. than it actually is either. No, no, absolutely not. I think what you do is emphasize the positives. Um, you know, I think covering up is something you don't want to do. It's fine if you don't mention the negatives, that's okay, but you don't want to pretend something is different from how it is. So in terms of how you get the message across, I think you certainly want to emphasize the positive points of the story you're making. You want to minimize or maybe not mention the negative points, but what you don't want to do is lie. You don't want to say something is something when it isn't. Fair enough. I mean, it completely makes sense, um, you know, especially when the truth is uncovered 95% of the time. So what I think the stuff thing is that don't forget that I think now these days, you know, we live in a very digital age where there's sort of like Twitter, um, Instagram, you know, you may think that you can get away with covering something up, but there will be someone with a mobile phone or a camera who's seen something or ever heard something, which probably wasn't the case um, you know, even 10, 20 years ago, I think it used to be a lot easier to keep secrets than it is now. Mm, that, that is very true. I have to agree with that one. And what, um, how do you feel that's impacted the way in which you're able to do your job? Um, personally, it hasn't because, you know, I think it's a good thing. Um, you know, the, the, the march of digital technology, the fact that you've got so many more tools to communicate with is a very positive thing. Um, as I said, I've always personally taken the philosophy that there's no point in hiding or misrepresenting something. So um, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear from, really. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good motto for life, I think, more so than just PR. But <laughs> So t tell us a bit more about what you're working on right now and what kind of projects you have ongoing. 
Well, at the moment, we work uh, with Pirelli in Formula One, so um, off to the Canadian Grand Prix shortly, where we'll be supporting the in-house Pirelli Media Office. Um, at the same time, we've just finished a rally of Portugal, where we've been working with Toyota, so again, we've been supporting their um, in-house presence there. And we're also working on a few sort of longer term projects as well, some completely outside of motorsport, um, which is interesting. You know, um, there's there's a catering company we're launching, the real Italian catering company. Um, so, you know, that's that's, you know, pizzas is about as far removed from motorsport as you can get. So, <laughs> uh, so it's nice to have a sort of variety of things. I'd say no two days are, are typical. Um, it's not really that I work on one thing for one day. Um, it's more sort of your day split into l several little chunks of different projects projects, some short term, some long term. So I think uh, an interesting question for people who maybe are in journalism and would like mm -hmm. to kind of transfer to PR potentially would ask, I mean, for one of the first questions was how did people think that you even had the skill set to increase the, you know, and work as a PR agent sort of thing in, in, in um, your early days when, for example, you were a journalist, why mm -hmm. would they come to you to ask these things when there are obviously hundreds of other people who can help them and are specializing in that field? That's a really good question. I wish I knew the answer. I don't know. Um, I, I think really, I guess, as a journalist, the more you're visible, the more you do, the more people you talk to, the more connections you have. Other people start thinking, well, you've got experience of this. So I, I guess you get to a point where, you know, you're, you're sufficiently established in your field or you, you know a sufficient number of people to make other people think that your opinion is worth having. Of course, but businesses don't obviously start overnight, right? Like you have to actually put in a lot of time and effort to create these things and start these things up. And you've said the word we quite a few times. So talk us through a little bit about how um, the team came about and how you actually transitioned from a one person team as a journalist, obviously, to creating a company. Yeah, we've got a team of five now and it started off as a team of one, which was me. <laughs> um, so uh, the team of one really was, was going for two years, something like that. And I was a journalist at the same time as doing bits and pieces of freelance PR. So I was uh, moonlighting from my day job and that was quite good fun. And then it got to the point where the moonlighting bit really took over from the day job. So I thought, well, let's do that full time. And then when I did that full time, you get to a point after a year or two when you think that, well, you know, the amount of stuff I'm being asked to do, I really need some help. So then um, I employed another person and uh, that was in 2010 2011 and then again we continued as two people for probably two years and then we got a third person then a fourth and then a fifth and that's where we are now sounds like a good trajectory i mean um it's yeah, one, it's one of the most kind of growth you don't want to get too big too quickly and um you still want to have i think enough time when you're sort of running a company still to be able to actually relate and work with your clients as opposed to just running your own employees your own business so to speak mm, i understand have a bit more of a personal connection and touch to it and uh, the other thing is is like you've actually done it the complete right way around where you've seen um you know there's you've actually found a need that people have come to you with then solve that need and then expand it on that need and try to grow your business naturally through that rather than assuming people have a need uh, hmm. for something that doesn't exist necessarily, but you think it's a great idea and then going ahead with, <laughs> with your business, which is one of the most common reasons why entrepreneurs fail, right? So yeah, I guess yeah. you've done it right. Well, I don't know. I mean, like, um, I'd like to think there was a plan. The truth is there was never really a plan. It just happened. As I said, it all evolved very organically just through sort of like knowing people and being asked to do things at no point. Um, I'm, uh, I should be, but I'm not the person to sit down and write a business plan or, or even make a list of targets or anything like that. It's something that happened more or less by itself. Yeah, that's a, and, and obviously you've hired the right sort of people to actually bring on more people in the first place as well. That's, that's, a, that's a big yeah. deal. So two things there. What kind of characteristics did you look for when you were trying to find someone as your right-hand man to try and um, grow the business? It's really, really hard. Um, and the reason why it's really, really hard is... The skill set is one thing, but if you're dealing a lot with motorsport, people are being asked to give up a lot of their spare time at weekends. And to find someone, and of course, don't forget that motorsport events obviously finish on a sort of late in the evening. And it's, 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 it's quite hard to find someone with the right skill set 
but it's much harder to find someone with the right mindset that they're willing to put in, you know, one of very, very long, very, very antisocial hours. Because what most people want to be doing on a Saturday and Sunday is spending time with their friends or family or in the pub. What they don't want to be doing is writing press releases on a Saturday or Sunday night. In front of so the that's computer. very, very hard. So um, the biggest challenge, I guess, there's lots of people who, who want to do motorsport PR. They say they want to do motorsport PR. You then put to them, well, you know, this is actually what we need doing. So, you know, you need to be on call every weekend to post on Instagram. You need to be sort of, you need to be writing stuff. You know, sometimes, you know, if you have a race that's going on, uh, I've no idea, in Asia or America, depending on your time zone, yeah, you need to be there at 3am to write the uh, write the post-race press release, you know, even though you're not there. You need to be calling people, you need to be available. Um, that's that's the hardest thing. So it is, that's, that's probably the hardest thing, is actually to find someone who is willing to sort of put in the hours and make the sacrifices. Because I think what many people think is motorsport PR is a sort of glamorous life, um, sipping champagne on a track stay. <laughs> um, I think for some people, when the reality bites, it's, it's, it's not as pleasant as they think it's going to be. So I think the, the biggest myth essentially in PR is the fact that you're going to be enjoying the journey of just kind of interacting with the people that you would love to interact with, rather than actually spending time really just uh, most of the time not all of the time but a lot of the time um working odd hours to try and complete a job to make your business successful basically it's it's both of that it's both of that i mean there, there are some good bits and you know interacting with uh, with racing drivers in far-flung locations is 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 part of the appeal um but it would be a mistake to think it's just that there are other things which are much much sort of like closer to daily grind um as well as that you know we do corporate press releases things to do with companies performances financial reports new products stuff that is you know actually quite dull um so it's not all glamour that's that's yes, understood. and it's certainly not all just sort of like swanning around from nine to five um being a hero a lot Stuff which is antisocial, late at night, dull, unpleasant, and you'd really lower rather be elsewhere. Yeah, uh, completely understand that. And I think um, the outcome of that, I think one of the biggest questions that people want to know from you is what can they do to increase their reach um, in motorsport? In terms of drivers, it's certainly being available and being proactive. Um, I think you'd be surprised at the number of drivers who focus on just their driving career as as being enough their talent as being enough to get them through everything they need to do um that's not the case they really need to make themselves marketable they need to work on their image they need to be available and they need to provide journalists and even their pr agencies with interesting stories to tell about themselves um you know it's 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 easy to see inside their minds because of course most of them are are quite young kids um, and they don't really think about, you know, what makes a good story and how to sell themselves. So um, if you say, well, you know, what did you get up to last week? Tell us something interesting that, you know, we can put on your social media or put in a preview or something like that. Oh, I don't know, I didn't do much. <laughs> they, need, they, need to, they need to do better than that. So they need to think, hey, well, you know, and, and, and something that's sort of like a little bit striking. So not just I worked on my fitness or I went for a jog or something mm. like that. It's, I've no idea, you know, I went to visit something, I went to see someone, I went to do something, I read this book, just something that, you know. You're like you a know, bit of a dad when you're talking to them, like, is it, is it one of these things? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're something else, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's not a general rule because, you know, we're lucky enough to work with some people who are really, really switched on. And, you know, they'll say to you, oh, I don't know, I read this book or this magazine article which really inspired me. And you know, they'll talk to you about that. And you think, well, that's a great story. You know, that's, that's something that... Something you know, I can work with, yeah. That you can, you, can, you, can, you can work with, exactly. Or, you know, I went to the... Oh, I have no idea. I went rock climbing and while I was there, I took a few photos because I thought they'd be useful, you know, to put on my social media. It's, mm. it's things like that which make your life a lot easier. But um, some people don't think about. So they think, well, you know, I drive the car quickly. That's enough. The fact is there's quite a lot of people who can drive a car quickly, but not that many people who can drive a car quickly and be marketable because at the end of the day, what motorsport depends on is, is sponsorship. You know, you won't go anywhere unless you're marketable enough for a sponsor to back you or a manufacturer to back you. And if they don't know who you are or they don't find you sufficiently interesting to engage with you, then you're obviously giving yourself a harder job. 
So, I mean, you work with so many people over the course of, you know, the last few decades or at least the last decade, if not more. So tell us some interesting stories and anecdotes about what kind of um, things you've heard or seen or would like to share with the audience. Well, you know, I was thinking about this and, and the problem is that probably we wouldn't like to share any of them with an audience because they all involve drivers behaving very, very badly after they've sort of... <laughs> like, well, there's an incident with a very famous driver, a hotel suite and a fire extinguisher, which I probably shouldn't go into. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's another driver who at the airport security machine decided to fit, you know, the little x-ray through security, decided to see if he could fit himself through it once hung over once. So there's all sorts of, sort of like things that go on, which... Um, which I'd, I'd love to tell people about, but I think, unfortunately, you have to be a bit discreet as well. So it's... A... I understand. It's a bit of a... I'm trying to think if there's anything publishable, but... Um, <laughs> if it's um, publishable, it's already been published. Something, <laughs> something, might, something might occur. Um, but I believe this is a family show, isn't it? So. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing is, you know, you're in a situation where, like, like a dad, you know, you're like to your son, hey, so what'd you get up to? How's school? It's like, good. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah, exactly. the level of conversation i'm starting to feel from uh you know you yes yeah, i mean like it's not a general rule i mean like yeah, we're privileged to work with some you know really 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 good people um you know i'd, li I'd like to mention for example jack aitken who we work with who's renault's um test driver in formula one um and you know look at some of jack's social media this is stuff that he does himself by the way we don't help him with it at all he's brilliant um you know he's someone who's very very marketable results so so, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's by no means a general rule. There are some, some good exceptions as well. Yeah, of course. And, you know, one of the things that you mentioned as well is that um, social media has transformed the way people obviously interact naturally. And um, what do you feel like the future holds in terms of communications? You know, it's, it's one of these things where it's changed so much in the last 10 years. Yeah. You know, how much guarantee can you really have over the next 10 years? It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, like, you, you got it exactly there because, like, you know, I don't think we would have thought even 10 years ago that the things that are possible now are. Um, I, I think probably what will happen is there'll be less and less of a role for traditional PR because a bit like sort of websites and Instagram profiles, profiles drivers and people will be doing more things for themselves. So, you know, just in the same way that now you can create your own website without having any experience of websites. You just go to, you know, any of the website sites and creates one, you know, you'll have people who are running their own PR campaigns. So there'll probably be less of a need for PR, but probably more of a need to um, have someone guiding people as to how to use all the resources that are there available. Um, you know, managing, I guess, right? Like also kind of uh, helping them understand how to actually make it effective rather than just yeah, I think so yeah I mean I think sort of like you know in terms of getting coverage for example um it's easier now to get coverage than it ever has been because you know everyone's a blogger there are so many websites out there um but it's sometimes quite hard to see the wood for the trees there are so many tools out there so many publications out there um that it's quite hard to know where to sort of like use your resources um, so I think that's probably the future. I think we'll see sort of like technologically more people doing things for themselves, but perhaps needing guidance as to how to use all the different platforms and opportunities. Um, you know, in the past, a, a sort of real plank of PR has been the press release, that piece of paper that comes out of the races and events or to announce stuff. I think that will gradually die. We're already seeing it dying. I think, you know, everything will become more and more digital. Um, and of course, there'll be also more and more of a need to do things in real time. People want things sooner and sooner and sooner. That goes back to the thing I was talking about earlier on, when what young people joining PR don't realize is that, you know, yes, you will have to be there at three o'clock in the morning issuing those updates because people these days don't want to wait till the following morning. They want to have the news as soon as it happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, you'll see things happening more and more in real time, more and more digitally. People will be able to do things more for themselves, but what they might need is just a little bit of guidance as to how to do it. Hmm. Any later than live is too late. Exactly, exactly. And, and that was never the case, you know, sort of like, uh, um, it's quite funny, but I was reading something um, about uh, uh, a magazine. And um, in the past, their correspondents used to go to events abroad. It's a British magazine. And they actually used to write their reports by, by longhand on paper. And they used to go to the nearest post office and actually post the reports. And then they would arrive in London two or three days later and then they'd get published by the magazine the following week. And, you know, obviously publishing a magazine a week or two after something has happened was normal um, several years ago. But now, you know, what the digital age has done is, is made people expect things straight away. 
Um, so, so that I think, you know, you're going to have more and more real time. You're going to have more and more immediacies. Um, you're also going to have fewer places to hide a thing. So, you know, when you do have a, a sort of a crisis or a wobble or whatever, um, there's not going to be many places to hide from it. You know, everything you do is going to be sort of in the public eye very, very quickly. Scrutinised so, very much so, yeah. Absolutely. And, and that also goes back to what I say really about how things have changed. There's no point in trying to spin things or hide things because inevitably things will get found out if you if you try and cover them up. And that will actually be more the case in the future rather than less. Plus the fact that I think, you know, the world has changed. There's a sort of climate of, um, what do you call it, accountability, transparency. I think people people are more used to sort of like seeing things told as they are and they're genuinely outraged now if people try to cover things up or lie whereas in the past it was part of everyday life really yeah it was a bit more accepted as the norm yeah i see what you mean and how does um the pr world for motorsport vary compared to other industries um i don't think it does uh really um i guess sort of like the guiding principles i would say are exactly the same in the end, sort of motorsport is part of an industry. It's part of an automotive industry. The reason why motorsport exists is for car manufacturers to sell their cars by showcasing what they can do. So it doesn't vary hugely in it. Um, obviously, you know, if you're looking at the very top level, Formula One, you're dealing with very, very big sums of money. So the consequences of a wrong decision can become very, very costly. So people are much more sort of sensitive or aware of being seen to be wrong or making a mistake. Um, but um, and then of course motorsport the whole point about motorsport is is it's fast it's quick it's contemporary so you know I think it's people expect um, a speed and a reaction within the world of motorsport which maybe doesn't happen in other more sedate environments um, but apart from that I don't think there's probably a huge amount of difference I think the principles are still largely the same Okay, understood. And I think let's end it on this last question. What do you believe is something that is very true that you believe is is 100% right that not many other people agree with you on in the industry? Um, I think it's actually what I said before. I think, you know, lots of colleagues say, well, you know, you should try and spin a story in a particular way, or you should try and persuade a journalist of your point of view. Um, or you should, um, you know, ring up a journalist, you should badger him until he accepts your point of view. If, if you've been a journalist, you know that this is counterproductive behaviour. Um, if you try and sell a journalist a story, it's just going to irritate him or her. It did me when I was a journalist. You'd be more likely not to run it um, just to teach that person a lesson. You'll think, you know what, you've rung me up five times a day about this really, really boring piece of news, which I'm not interested in publishing. I'm really not going to do it. In fact, every time you call again, I'm going to make sure you don't answer your call. So um, I guess where I differ is not just me. I mean, I think there are other people who think the same too. But what I always try and do is is not hide anything at all. And if something is, is really not very interesting, I'm not going to sell it with conviction. I'm not going to pretend something is newsworthy if it's not. Completely understand. I mean, thank you for that invaluable information, Anthony. It's been a pleasure having you on the RaceCoin podcast. Thank you very much. If you like this episode of the Racecoin podcast, go ahead and subscribe so you can get notified every Monday when a new episode is out. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.